Welcome, everybody. I've just started the recording. Um, I am Marco Hansen. This is Margaret Hansen. We are the owners of Texan Translation in Austin and Houston, Texas, and we're so glad to have you join us today for a little demo on how to translate Cuban and Honduran birth certificates. Uh, we did Mexican birth certificates last week, so if you missed that, it's on YouTube now. But we get a lot of Cuban and Honduran, too. I'd say those are probably number two and three, don't you think? Yeah. Top five, anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. We do do a lot of Cuban. So um, I put up a little poll. Uh, just I'm curious where everybody's from. And so if you haven't seen that yet, um, that's probably like underneath something on your screen under some other window. Uh, but if you could click on there and give us an idea of where you are, that might help us make sure we're focusing our our comments in a way that's helpful. Uh, I know Jackie Dominguez. She's going to be our co-host, actually. Uh, make co-host. Uh, she's a uh, the other administrator of Become a Texas Court Interpreter Facebook group, and so she's real involved in all these training efforts. Hi, Jackie. So uh, the way this works, if you haven't been here before, is we just take an actual uh, birth certificate that's been altered for privacy and translate it live on screen. And as we go, you're welcome to put questions in the chat if something doesn't make sense or if you disagree, that's fine. A lot of this is uh, subjective. There are many correct ways to translate anything, but we're just going to go with uh, sort of the style and the procedure that we've come up with from a lot of feedback from a lot of different clients and end users like USCIS over the years. And so we're presenting uh, one way to do it, not necessarily uh, the only way. So let me share screen with our Word file. And if you would like to follow along, I will um, put the link where you can download this actual file. Um, and let's see, so many windows. Uh, we're going to start with Cuban. So copy link address and then putting this in the chat. You should be able to click on this link in the chat and download the file. If that doesn't work, let me know and I'll try sending it a different way. You should also be seeing a, a Word file on your screen right now, um, the Honduran birth certificate. Let me make sure I'm sharing that screen. Yes, give me a thumbs up if you can see a Honduran birth certificate on your screen. Are we doing Honduran or Cuban? Um, oh, are we doing Cuban? We're doing Cuban. Okay, yeah, let's do Cuban first. You see Cuban? Give me a thumbs up. Martha, I'm looking at you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Um, I appreciate somebody having her camera on just so we feel like we're not sitting here all by ourselves at work talking to each other. <laughs> you know, you know, so, uh, excuse me, some of us do not have Facebook. We are the ones that are a little bit that live in the primitive age. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's for different reasons. You know, I used to teach, I retire. And my students did wonderful things with my Facebook page. So I don't do Facebook anymore. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful things. I, I'm suspicious. <laughs> um, well, then I will try putting a different kind of link here in the chat that does not go through Facebook, that goes directly to the document. And that should be okay. easy for you to access. Thank you. Sure. So last week, we, we talked a lot about certification statements and who can certify and, and what you should say in that. And I'm not going to get into that again unless you have specific questions. I'll just skip over the first page. This is my generic cover sheet. Um, and if it were, sorry, I'm on the hospital desktop. OK, that's fine. Um, and uh, if we were sending this to USCIS, we would just delete the uh, entire notary statement because they don't need it to be notarized for certain other end users would leave that on there. And so I'll skip down to page two where we've placed an image of the doctored um, Cuban birth certificate. And I'm going to switch to a split screen view so we can see the original on top and the translation is going to go down here on page three. 
All right. And you can see that it's doctored, and we intentionally made it a little bit, um, not a great job of, of, of doctoring it up so that it's obvious that it's doctored, so that nobody's going, oh, they've put this, somebody's real birth certificate is now where everyone can see it. It looks a little like, it looks like we kind of slapped stuff on there because we wanted to be clear. This is not, <laughs> there's no real person named whatever this person is named with this, this, this is totally fake. We just picked random names and stuck random pieces of information. It's not a real birth certificate. Thank you. So looking at the top of this page, I thought there's basically three different columns of um, items going on here. And so I'm going to create a three uh, by one table and insert that. And last week we went over in a lot of detail how to create different kinds of tables. And can you explain why we like tables better than text boxes, Margaret? Uh, tables are great. Tables you can do more with. You can manipulate them much more easily. You can move them around better. You can add more columns or rows um, and combine those columns and rows to make four out of two or three out of two or two out of seven. You, you can just manipulate them more easily and then and add and subtract things more easily. And a text box is easy to kind of grab and move, but that means if you're trying to redo it, later on, that text box ends up being in a way, that, in the way, it ends up being a liability rather than an asset. And if you do things in a table, um, it, it's just way easier to manipulate and there are a lot more options available to you. Um, if you're working in, we're working in Word, which is great and I recommend it. You can do stuff like this uh, in a Google Doc, but A, you've got to be concerned with uh, security because you're just working online. And, and that can be um, easier to access by um, hackers. hackers, yes, uh, bad actors. Um, and it just is less powerful. There are just fewer options available to you in terms of formatting and that sort of thing in a Google document compared to a Word document. Thank you. 963, help me out with these numbers. It's a lot of numbers. You know, I'm not good with numbers. You're doing great so far. Two, zero, 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 three, six, Five one. All right. Uh, I'm double checking. That is the correct number zero. Then I'm going to put in brackets my translator's note. There's a text stamp down here. So as Marco's typing, I can kind of give you a little uh, um, running Narration. commentary. Yeah, what he's doing. So when there is something on the document that's not um, like it doesn't say anywhere on the document the word logo. The very first thing that Marco put in on on his. Uh, Translation is the word logo. It doesn't say the word logo. He's put that in square translators note brackets. So anything in those square brackets indicates something that he wants the recipient to know, but that isn't text on the document. So he wrote logo because there's some little something there. I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter, but it's there. And so we want to make note that, that it exists on the document because everything on the document should be represented. And then he puts what it says, REC, and under that, we don't have a civil status registry in the United States. That doesn't exist. So we have to come up with a rough equivalent for, for U.S. purposes. So in the United States, the place you get a birth certificate is from a vital statistics registry. It's really a county clerk's office, but if your country doesn't have counties, then you're not going to have a county clerk. And so this is one of those situations where you have to subjectively say, I, as the translator, need to figure out something that makes sense in the user's country uh, that will be understandable, that is close to a, a parallel idea so that the end user can, can make sense of what it is that you've written. You can say just civil status registry, maybe, and, and some people do, and that's fine. Um, but it just needs to be something that, that makes enough sense for the end user to understand what it is that's going on. So then coat of arms, again, it's, it's a thing. What is that blob? I mean, there's probably a flag in there. There's probably some leaves of some kind. Coat of arms, that does the trick. You see that he's put circular rubber stamp. That indicates there's a thing there that somebody stamped on it. Um, so he's describing, in those translator brackets, he's describing items and then putting the text from the item in there the text stamp and then he says what this text stamp says um it says oh not 
Onat's not the thing. Onat is the initials of the thing. And the thing is, I don't remember what it is, Oficina Nacional Administrativo something. So I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm making up what I think it means. I don't remember. <laughs> but we Googled it. Yeah. At some point, we went back and did the research to figure out what that thing is and then come up with what that means. And so we've written on that because it says that. And then we've put in translators brackets. This is what that thing is. The ONAT is the National Tax Administration Office. Yes, and I'm going to turn off these borders here so that it looks more like the original so you're not looking at those squares. Good, good. And it's uh, important to keep in mind when you're working on a translation like this, um, a couple of things. One is that the recipient is going to have both the English and the Spanish versions right there because we're putting the original in as a placed image. And so he or she can refer back and forth and confirm details. If we've chosen to, say, translate the name of an organization and she wants to know what the actual name in Spanish was, she can just flip back a page and look at it. And so all that information is available. And also, um, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for a government worker in the United States who speaks no Spanish to glance at the English page and quickly pull out the useful information that's pertinent for processing this residency or whatever application it is. Tunas de Sasa. Isn't that a fun name? That's a real place in Cuba. I've never been to Cuba, but after I worked on this, I was like, I want to go to Tunas de Sasa. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Municipality is how we're rendering municipio. Um, again, Tunas de Sasa. And province. Sancti Spiritus. Sancti Spiritus. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep, that's Province. Good. Let's see if I can spell English correctly today. That'll be my big challenge. So I finished doing this section here. I'm going to turn off those, those uh, borders as well by right-clicking on it and choosing no borders. Uh, next, we have a list of uh, text along the left side um, for the names of all the people involved. And uh, looking at the original in Spanish, I... Uh, I see that it looks like maybe it's bold um, in the in the form, and then the actual text was typed not bold, but I'm not going to really bother with that in this case because I feel that's irrelevant. I am going to use um, typical American English capitalization. Um, instead of nombres y apellidos, nombres indicates primer nombre, segundo nombre, apellido paterno, apellido materno. And in English, we just call that full name. That means the same thing, even though it's not an exact equivalent. It's the closest cultural equivalent. I right. You could put names and surnames. You could put given names and surnames. That's a common term in English for your first and middle name is your given name. Um, but I agree, full name tell, tells us what we need to know. It, it, it gives us the information in a, a more common uh, term. Yeah. Um, also, I am leaving out the accent marks. There's an accent mark in Garcia. Cuba is one of the few countries that actually bothers with accent marks in people's names. They take it seriously. Bravo, Cuba. But a lot of other countries will just put it in all caps and they go like, oh, it's all caps. We don't have to use accent marks. Um, but when I'm translating into English for vital statistics forms, I don't use written accent marks. Just like, you know, for translating from Russian, we don't use the Russian alphabet. We put it into a format that's easy for the English speaker to understand. And in the American alphabet, there are no accent marks, and there are no um, uh, some of the two dots are called Dieresis. English. Thank you. Oh, is that the English? Dieresis. Dieresis. I don't know. Okay. Um, and so, uh, monolingual Americans don't have any idea what those are. They don't know what they do. They don't know how to how it aids pronunciation. And so, to them, it doesn't aid pronunciation. And so, the American alphabet. Um, standard. Just, yeah, the standard alphabet used in, in American English does not have accent marks or tildes or any, any other extraneous lines and marks and squiggles and dots. And so, unless you're trying to be pretentious and like talk about French stuff. Sure, sure. And I guess we, in some words that we borrow from other countries, like resume, there are those accent marks, but whoever gets that right, like whoever remembers which way those accent marks go. Every time I have to Google it. Right, right. I'm and, a translator. And we don't really know what that means because there, there's not two accents. Like we don't say 
resume or resume, like what, what does that mean? And so it's just confusing to, to a monolingual American to have that stuff in there. And so we, as translators, choose to not include those. Some people do. Some people leave them in there because that's the correct way to write the person's name. And that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's what you want to do. But I agree with Marco in that if we were going from a, an alphabet that was not A, B, C, D, E, F, G alphabet, like a Russian alphabet or an Arabic alphabet or um, some other writing system, we couldn't. Chinese. We couldn't do that. We would have to transliterate and do it best we could. Use whatever the the person has chosen as their American spelling for things. So it's it's. It's debatable. Now, I've also chosen to leave off the periods after each name in the Cuban original. There's a period that is unusual in English, and it conveys no meaning in English, and so I've left those off to stick with the more common U.S. style. Um, I, I think it's interesting that in Cuba they, they put just the first name of the grandmother and the grandfather and not, not the last As name. though you're going to know what it is. Yeah, you can figure it from out. From right? the, Yeah, <laughs> from, from the registr registrant's name, which you should. But, but again, the, the monolingual USCIS agent won't necessarily yeah. be able to derive that information. And, and if it were important, we could put it as a translator's note, but I don't think... USCIS cares what the last names of the grandparents were. Right, and we we have to be careful about things like that. We don't want to assume assume or change or amend any of the information on the document without without evidence of of its validity. And so we don't want to put in surnames that aren't explicitly shown. Yeah, good point. So here we have a sentence that I think is a good example of how many different ways there are to say the same thing in another language. La presente certificación no tiene fecha de vencimiento. Um, I, I chose to write, this certification has no expiration date. La presente indicates the one that we're talking about here. Um, in a, another sample I'm looking at, it says this certificate does not have an expiration date. That means the exact same thing. And so don't be afraid to word something in a way that sounds most natural to you. And if you, let's say, English is your second language and you're not sure how is this normally expressed in English, um, a little trick to um, look at the statistics is to mm -hmm. just put it in quotation marks and copy and paste it into the Google search bar and see how many hits you get. So if I, yeah. if I did this cert certification as no expiration date in quotes and put it in and there are 173,000 examples in Google of people saying that exact sentence in English and then I try phrasing it a different way and there are only 17 hits, then probably that is uh, an unusual way to say it. That's not very scientific, but no, but but definitely if if you're going into a, a language that's not your dominant language, not your your native language, that's a great way to get a better idea of do, do people say it this way. Um, if you know, this certification has no expiration date, if you said um, no expiration date has the certificate, like Yoda. Right. If you put that in quotes and put that into Google, you're not going to get as many hits for sure as the certification has no expiration date because people say it that way a lot. And so you're going to get 27 million hits this way versus you know, 27 hits the other way. And so it is a good way to just see, does anybody say this? Other than me. Other than me. <laughs> Sitting here by myself, scratching my head. Well, and I've done that just in debates with people over a more common expression in English. Like, you know, somebody says... Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe I've got uh, a lot of fish to fry. You know, maybe that's an expression that I heard growing up. Well, I got a lot of fish to fry. That means I'm very busy, right? Then maybe somebody else says, well, I got a lot of rats to kill. Well, that's gross, but what does that mean? What well, means I'm really busy? Well, that's not how we grew up saying. We always said fish, fish to, to fry, fry, rats to kill. But, and so you can Google and see. Which one is more popular or which one's more common? Which what do people say more? And that's just English and English and no translation involved, unless you consider a sort of country to Regional English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was my mother's country expression. <laughs> she spoke country as a native language. Yes, she really did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm tossing around some different ways to phrase the sentence here. Certifica la registradora certifica con los que los anteriores datos. The registrar certifies that the information above, los anteriores datos, concuerdan fiel, fielmente con los que aparecen. 
Um, course certifies the information corresponds accurately. Um, los que aparecen consignados en la inscripción accurately to the, the information found in the record, a la inscripción a que se hace referencia. In the record um, to which it refers. Uh, I don't love that in English, but I'm trying to make sure I convey all of the thoughts in the Spanish original. Okay. You okay with that? If I information about, of course, I have information. Okay, so the, 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 the registrador is the person that's the, the subject of the sentence. Mm -hmm. So the registrar certifies the information or the information above. Okay. What do you mean there? Accurately, yeah, or faithfully corresponds. Sure. Information found, the information which appears in the record. Information appearing in, yeah, I like that a little better. Appearing in the record. Or which appears, I lost the app, but it's coming out. We'll think about it. Sure. Okay. Um, now we have a licenciada. A licenciada means that she went to college and got something kind of like a bachelor's degree and then had to take uh, an exam to get a government license in some profession. We don't know which one, maybe law, maybe, you know, any of another, a number of other professions. And so to indicate that we have come up with the convention of putting licensed professional for licenciada. If you guys have another option, feel free to throw it out. That's one that's always a little tricky to translate. And we choose licencia or a licensed professional because it's vague and does not specify uh, the the major, the the career track, mm -hmm. because we don't know it. We, ju we just frankly don't know. Um, and in certain situations, it's, I think you are safe in guessing attorney, but in a lot of situations, you just, I mean, maybe it's something else. And so we just, because the term is vague, we have found a, a, an equally vague term it could be could mean a lot of different things because we don't have more information to point us in a, in a more specific direction. And la parte interesada is always, um, there's different ways to say that. We don't really say the interested party. I mean, I don't hear that in, yeah, in English, the interested party. I like the person in question. I feel that rolls up the tongue a little, a little better. The request of the person in question or the person concerned. How about that? Sure, the concerned party. The concerned party, sure, that's good. Um, and at the request of the person concerned. I'm trying to think when you've got like issued. like uh, uh, like three copies of something, like you've got the white copy, the pink copy, and the yellow copy, and one of them is for the person that's getting the thing done, mm -hmm. and then one is for the you know, like the, the office copy, the yeah. um duplicate copy. copy, right, and then there's the one for the person that's asking for the thing, you but I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that one's usually blank. Or customer, customer copy? But I, in this case, I wouldn't call you a customer if you're the no. registrant or the person yeah. requesting the document. I think it implies the registrant, la parte interesada, in this case, is the person whose birth certificate we're talking about. Right, but it's not always the registrant that's requesting the copies. A, a lot of times True. it's the parent. Yeah. Which is why we're talking about the interested party or the concerned party. <laughs> so the takeaway from all of this is it's up to interpretation. That is why we it's not a, it's not an exact science. It's an it's art. An art. <laughs> <laughs> you might like a blue or green. I may, may lean more towards the yellow green. Yes. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my Cuba Vera, Guayabera today in honor of the Cuban uh, translation we're doing and because it's hot um okay so next we have a centered uh signature so i'm going to use control c to center control u to underline and then just type signature like this and if they want to see the signature they can just refer to the actual signature um now, I'm going to say that it is possible that that line on which the signature is written is actually microtext. There is a fuzziness about it that makes me think it might be 
a line of text that is illegible at this size. And if it were, you can just write illegible microtext. Yeah, if they give you the original, then you can see it better than if it's uh, like a photo taken from an iPhone, like this one here. But Sometimes if you blow it up real big, if it's a real good quality photo, you can blow it up real big and see. Or if it's been scanned. Yeah. Registrar of Vital Statistics, Dunas de Sasa, Vital Statistics Registrar. You could say Vital Statistics Officer, Vital Statistics Official. I think that would be the same. Yeah, and this has uh, registrar of vital statistics. Del re right, of vital statistics registry. Registrar of no. the vital. See why you need a proofread here. Yeah, it's a little redundant, but they were redundant, so we will be redundant. Yeah. Then down below this, I see on the far left there is a cutoff rubber stamp. So I will say circular rubber stamp. Then I will indicate that it's cut off, which clues in the reader that there's part of it that we're not going to be able to translate. But I can see enough to translate this part. Ministry of Justice. You could say the Department of Justice. The sec I, Ministry or Department, I feel, are synonymous. People understood, yeah. 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 In, in Britain, it's, it's going to be a ministry. In the U.S., it's going to be a department. It says ministry, and I think that's easily understood. I don't think anyone's going to... Everybody's evolve. heard of ministries. Yeah. We, we all watch enough spy movies that are set in Britain to know <laughs> what a ministry is. Watching Alex Ryder, by the way, on Amazon right now is pretty good. A little uh, lighthearted uh, espionage action there. Okay, now since there are three separate columns here and two of them are centered, I think this is going to be easier if I insert a little text box. That's three by one. That's a table. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's a table. And then. Um, Put the signature down here. Maybe drag this over since that's a much wider section. And then on the far right, it might be hard to see on the screen, but on the far right, there is an embossed stamp that again is cut off. And I can't really read any of it. Um, so I'm going to put illegible embossed stamp. And embossed meaning one of those metal ones that presses into the paper and leaves a, an impression that you can feel. but harder to read. So let me... I think I would call that an embossed seal because the stamp implies that it gets pressed on top and in this case it's going around the edge of the paper and crimping it from both sides. So I, I would call that a seal. Very well. From now on I shall do the same. <laughs> Isn't he a good husband? <laughs> Listens to what I, say, what I say and he does it. It's because we're being recorded. <laughs> You want evidence that you're a good guy. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so that was a quick and dirty um, Cuban birth certificate, and I've now gotten to the bottom, so I'm going to click on View, Remove Split, and then Zoom Out so I can see the whole thing. I would go in everywhere where there's a yellow highlight. I would um, fill that in with the actual information pertaining to this translation. We're able to fit it on three pages, so you could print that up and sign it, or you could copy and paste a scanned image of your signature onto here and export it as a PDF if you're emailing it to somebody. Um, do you have any questions about this first translation before we shift gears and do Honduras? I have a question. Why did you make these two columns so far apart, the volume and page column, compared to the um original they're just not that far apart the volume and page code yeah volume the tomo and the folio oh you just have them really wide spread. yeah that looks better how's that that makes me happy <laughs> well if you're happy then yeah okay. all right any questions <laughs> nada <laughs>